The city of New Haven, Connecticut was attacked by British forces in the summer of 1779. The attack on New Haven was ordered by British General Henry Clinton. American General George Washington had his forces in a strong strategic position at West Point, New York, where his army commanded the heights above the Hudson River, denying British passage up the Great Waterway by employing both cannon and the Great Chain. General Clinton hoped that a British attack on Connecticut would draw Washington's army across the Hudson, thus making the Continental Army vulnerable to a confrontation with superior British land forces. General Clinton also ordered this invasion because Connecticut, with its many factories, was a major producer of weaponry for the Continental Army. At sunrise on July 5, 1779, over 1,500 British troops took to their longboats, headed for shore, and landed virtually unopposed at Savin Rock in West Haven, Connecticut. General William Tryon, the man in charge of the entire operation, took an additional 1,500 troops and landed on the East Haven side of New Haven Harbor at a place that is now known as Lighthouse Point. Unlike the unopposed landing in West Haven, Tryon's troops met immediate resistance from a company of 50 East Haven Patriots. British adjutant Walkins was mortally wounded as he hit the beach. The Patriots soon fell back and joined their main body who were defending the nearby high ground called Beacon Hill. The Patriots used musketry and a field cannon to defend this position, but had to abandon due to oncoming overwhelming forces and because Beacon Hill was in range of British cannon being fired from nearby British warships. The Connecticut militiamen were unable to stop the relentless advance by Tryon's forces, which included a regiment of Hessian mercenaries. The militia resorted to nuisance-like harassment of Tryon's army from a distance with inaccurate musketry and the occasional field piece. The Connecticut militia were unable to prevent Tryon's forces from burning eight houses and three barns during their march toward New Haven. Back on the West Haven side of the invasion, British forces were facing increasingly stronger Patriot resistance as they marched beyond West Haven Green toward New Haven. The Patriots, being familiar with the terrain and with the escape routes, were sniping and causing considerable casualties to the invaders. It was during this part of the battle that British officer William Campbell was fatally shot. Ironically, Campbell had done much to prevent his invading army from burning buildings in West Haven, and the people of West Haven posthumously recognized Campbell by naming the town's main thoroughfare after him. Campbell's tombstone can be found in West Haven with an epitaph that shows respect to Campbell's gestures of restraint. As the day wore on, Patriot resistance became stronger, with militia pouring in from surrounding towns. The Patriots brought a cannon into position at West Bridge, which was the invader's most direct route from West Haven into New Haven. This cannon and the determined militiamen fighting alongside prevented the British forces from attacking New Haven straight from the Allentown section of New Haven. In Defenders Park, near the New Haven-West Haven line, there is a monument that honors this Patriot valor. Now, that part of Tryon's invasion army that had landed in West Haven had to then march northward to find an easier place to ford West River in order to attack New Haven. The British were soon confronted by more and more determined militiamen streaming in from Derby, North Milford, and other surrounding towns. 23-year-old Aaron Burr, a former colonel in the Continental Army, was in New Haven at this time, and he took command of the militia that were confronting the British at this juncture of the battle. Burr, who would later be the third vice president of the United States and who would become a notorious historical figure for killing Alexander Hamilton in the infamous duel on July 11, 1804, arrived on the scene with a contingent of Yale students who also took up arms in New Haven's defense. Burr and his militia could only slow the advancing British, and soon the invaders were downtown in a pitched battle with all available militia at the corner of what is now Broadway and Dixwell Avenue. The overwhelming manpower and firepower of the British forces soon caused the militia to retreat to the northern outskirts of New Haven, giving up the city to the invaders. The western half of Tryon's invasion force had now overcome the Patriot resistance, and the eastern half of the invasion force, led by Tryon himself, would soon arrive at the New Haven Green and reunite the two forces into one army of 3,000 strong.
Throughout the day, news of the invasion had spread to all the nearby towns. Patriots were streaming in, and by nightfall, over 1,000 militia, with cannon in place, were threatening to counterattack. Leaders on both sides met and agreed that the British would refrain from burning down the city if the Patriots agreed to stand down with a fragile truce in place. Many British soldiers spent the night getting drunk and bothering citizens, while the Hessian troops guarded their perimeter. At sunrise the next day, Patriots allowed the British to leave the city unmolested. Wrote Tryon, not a shot fired at our retreat. By 10 a.m. that morning, July 6th, the entire British invasion force had sailed away from New Haven Harbor. Patriots reported 26 killed in action, with 52 of the invaders killed. General Tryon had a much different perspective, reporting only seven of his men killed. The truth probably lies somewhere in between. Within a week, the British conducted two similar raids on Connecticut, first on Fairfield and then on Norwalk. The raids proved to be of no strategic value, but served only to strengthen the will of the Patriot resistance. And despite the Connecticut raids by the British, George Washington kept his Continental Army, based at West Point, in strategic command of the vital Hudson River.